Uh, the course that I'm about to present, uh, philosophy uh, at the end of the 20th century, the self under siege, uh, it has been a difficult course for me to develop over the years, and it's been a difficult subject matter for me because uh, I have uh, been uh, trained in the classic tradition of philosophy, studied uh, ancient philosophy. I, I know many of the methods and, and have, have taken all the required logic courses and so on. Uh, I have uh, also done a lot of work in uh, continental philosophy as well. Uh, it seems to me that the late 20th century presents us with uh, one great and overriding problem, and that will be the, the focus of this course. And uh, I had second thoughts about even calling it a course in philosophy because the most current philosoph philosophical attempts to understand both the self, society, our place in it, and so on, have been what I will call deflationary. Uh, I'll use for an example, I will just mention an article by uh, uh, the philosopher Richard Rorty called The World Well Lost. Uh, this is the upshoot, now remember, of a, of a tradition that's at least 2,500 years old. and it's now, now that tradition is produced in tiny little articles, uh, four or five page articles in journals that are read by a number of people uh, uh, that's a small enough number that if they were all on a boat and it sank, they would have no readership. And it could be a small boat. It wouldn't, wouldn't need to be the Lusitania. It could be a raft, perhaps. But in any case, Rorty, in, in one of these journals, wrote an article called The World Well Lost and uh, developed a principle that uh, I think has become widespread toward the end of the 20th century concerning philosophy's role in informing us about ourself or about the world. The title itself indicates that the world well lost. Uh, it, uh, Rorty's view is that any uh, problem that's been around for 2,500 years and for which we still don't have a solution, uh, the uh, right response by the, uh, by the uh, contemporary philosopher is, I don't care. And it, the charm of Rorty's answer is it's so American. It's deeply rooted in our culture, and it's in both the anti-intellectualism of our culture, in our fear of eggheads, and so on. And so, in that sense, uh, uh, it has a double significance. I mean, positively, it means that the work of intellectuals has always been separate, uh, separated off from the work of ordinary people. In other words, you have to be freed from the constraints of manual labor. When I was a dishwasher, I didn't have a lot of time to do this. And when I was a union organizer, I didn't have a lot of time to do this. Uh, Any time I was involved in manual labor, I didn't really have the time to do this intellectual work. That separation, that fateful separation between intellectual and manual labor has been with philosophy throughout. Uh, it's rather disappointing, though, to have that tradition, the great tradition of thinking in general, be reduced to, uh, to a comment like, well, gee, I don't care. We, we haven't figured it out. Uh, similarly, let me give you one more example of the profound results of uh, recent contemporary analytic philosophy. The most widely accepted theory of truth is Tarski's theory of truth. Uh, I won't do it justice here, but I will, I think, uh, uh, give you an, an account that fairly summarizes its main insight. Tarski's theory of truth is, uh, it goes something like this. Uh, Tarski says, the sentence snow is white, and he puts snow and white in quotation marks, is true if and only if snow is white. Uh, I don't expect anybody in the audience to gasp if you follow me. This isn't a theory of truth. This is the deflationary remark about how we use the word true. You follow me? It's just, it's just this is not the upshot of, the, of what we thought were the glowing and humanistic accounts that, that I appreciate to this day, developed by Socrates, Aristotle, all the way through Aquinas and so on. And in the late 20th century, what we get in area after area are these, what I will call deflationary accounts. Uh, on the upside, these accounts don't pretend to know much. I mean, that, that's the upside for me. In other words, they're not overly grand. And 
Uh, I have no idea what other courses the teaching company has been offering lately except through the catalog, and I don't want to undermine any of them. But, for example, the uh, substantive attempt to defend God in an intellectual setting where philosophical argument is key has been doomed for so long that that won't be our central attention, although we, we may mention that as we go by, go through today. Well, why do I start with these rather snotty remarks, if they are snotty? I mean, it may turn out these deflationary things are all we do know, that snow is white if and only if it's white, and, and that if we can't tell whether we're free or determined after 2,000 and something years, then the best attitude to take is I don't really give a damn. I mean, if that turns out to be the right view, we'll, we'll, we'll leave ourselves with that. But there are some problems, and this is going to be the heart of the course, about which a deflationary view is hard to take, and one is our view of ourselves as selves. Our own self-reflective view about what we are as human beings, what is our place in our society, in our world, and more importantly, maybe, what is our place vis-a-vis -vis our commitments, our stations in life, our roles as husbands, wives, fathers, and I guess today to be absolutely correct about everything, significant others, significant other others, dogs and cats, whatever. I mean, you know, let's cover the whole gamut here to try to be contemporary. Uh, <coughs> these are questions about which it's, it's extremely deflationary to go, oh yes, the self, uh, I haven't got one. I mean, that's, that's disappointing in, in a different kind of way. I mean, many of you say sentences that are true without having a theory of truth, I hope, and I mean, I, I, it routinely happens. It happens in pool halls. People say, I can make the eight, and they make it, and you go, that's, that's true. I mean, we, and, but you don't then ask for a theory of truth. Very few of you have a theory of structural grammar or empirical grammar, but most of you don't say sentences like, squag, blah, 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 blah. You say sentences like, it's raining today. And yet, it would be kind of silly to ask you for a theory of grammar. And again, the self is a, is a different story with the self, the human subject. I'm not saying that you'll tell your story, whatever your story happens to be, to just anyone. But it's hard for me to imagine, and perhaps this difficulty in imagining it is just my difficulty in dealing with the world as it is today. It's difficult for me to imagine anyone taking that kind of cavalier attitude about their view of themselves. And I'd like to argue in a strong sense that every one of us has some kind of theory of what we are as a person. Now, by that I don't mean a, a really highly developed theory like one in uh, quantum mechanics or anything like that. Uh, I may only mean a narrative story, something that connects or attempts to connect the various disconnected episodes in our lives. Something that gives us a reason to think we're the same person today that we were yesterday in some important sense, if that sense only means that you've still got the same driver's license. I mean, in some way we want to have a narrative about our lives, about ourselves. We want them to mean something, in short. And I don't want to go off in this first lecture on a long, uh, uh, exegetical uh, set of remarks on this new phrase, which I'm afraid is going to be just a part of pop psychology, the politics of meaning. I don't have any idea what they're talking about, okay? I don't know. This isn't what I'm... T what I'm talking about is something much more immediate. And it may, in fact, have political implications. By that, I mean it may mean that people can have refrigerators, nice cars, nice homes, nice children, and nice degrees, and you know, nice friends and have absolutely no sense of who the hell they are and be in utter despair. In fact, uh, that condition on the account I'll be giving will be structurally common. This is not a, like a slam on any people who are personally here in the audience today or any people viewing me. It's not a personal remark. It's a structural condition. This, and so, therefore, the title, The Self Under Siege. And uh, whether philosophy is the right discipline to look at this problem or not is, is unimportant to me. 
because uh, in, in, in looking at it myself, I've been uh, guided more by the problem than by, than by the discipline that I started out working in. I mean, when I look at a college curriculum and see how it's divided, and we've got curriculum committees that redivide them like once a week or once a month, and then once a year, they, I mean, I don't give a damn what studies this or who talks about it, but that it's part of the ongoing conversation of our species about itself, you know, who we are seems to me to be very important, if, even if it's taught in the, in the curriculum under the heading basket weaving. It's, a, it's an utterly crucially important uh, topic in my view. The self under siege, this is, uh, uh, comes about, I think, in part, the, 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 the sort of uh, apocalyptic tone to the lectures comes about in part because I really do believe that new factors, new social factors and others in the late 20th century have led to a kind of pressure on human beings on selves, not on as individuals, not as individuals, but on them anonymously. In fact, the systems I have in mind are anonymous systems. Uh, and I'd like to characterize a few of those, and uh, as I do so, what I'll be, I'll be running through what I might call some of the pathologies of the 20th century and, and, and see if there's any way that a conversation rooted in philosophy, in some sense at least, uh, could help us find our way about in it. The most obvious one in the late 20th century, and I thought about this in the hotel room this morning as I saw the arteries of the beltway running like human blood through a body into the city. Uh, and then I also thought about the following thing. I think I mentioned at the end of my last lecture on Nietzsche when I was discussing the postmodern condition. And that's what I would call the information overload. And, and I'll try to, try to make, make this come alive with, a diff, with an example uh, from a different culture. Uh, let's take being uh, a Tonkawa Indian in West Texas. They're, they weren't a very well-known tribe, but they are from my home area, so I'll mention them. The Tonkawa Indians' reservoirs for meaning, the best cultural anthropology work we have, were rich, but a limited array of roles, stations, things to be and so on. But they were rich and holistic. In other words, in that sense, there was an array of things you could, uh, you could choose to be. There were a wide array you could choose not to be, like chief. You didn't exactly choose to be that. But among this array, the, the, the decision paths were relatively simple, relatively simple. And the information load you received in, the load of information, the number of images and so on that you saw, the number of things that actually touched your skin, impinged upon your perceptual apparatus and stuff, quite limited. Compare that situation uh, to the 19th century, and already we have uh, uh, human beings under a con considerably more pressure, because from the late 19th and into the early 20th century, we, many things come about that we don't think about philosophically, but which shape our, our reflection, not only in philosophy, but in everyday life. I mean, we walk into a B. Dalton's as though there were always cheap paperbacks available to everyone. But that's actually a quite recent development in the history of the world. We fill our universities with them as though they're, they're some ancient treasure, and television is some degraded form of the present. And of course, that's idiocy. Those cheap books have only been around very recently in the history of, the, uh, of, of, of thinking. Television now has been around for about, you know, almost a third of that same time. So, it, it, so the point I'm driving at here is the incredible increase in information, the amount and the tons of information. This city itself, and I think I've said this before too, this city itself, Washington, D.C., is a good example. I think if you took all the information collected in the history of the world between the dawn of humanity, earlier than the Dead Sea Scrolls, back when, oh, I don't know, hell, maybe Steven Spielberg did it in Jurassic Park, back when dinosaurs put their tails in the mud and whatever, all the marks, sensible marks left by beings of whatever kind, 
I'm almost certain that in the last eight years in Washington, there's more information piled in four buildings than the whole previous informational load of the history of the human species. To give you an example that may be more immediate, think of the JFK assassination. Is our problem there lack of complexity? Lack of information? No. No, we know too damn much about it. Way too much. There are too many possible assassins, too many secret plots, too many, too many movies, too many books. And under this kind of complexity, the self finds itself in a position where the array of choices of what to believe or not to believe become bewildering, utterly bewildering. Now, this is about events like, you know, the assassination and so on. But, uh, you know, the more important beliefs are beliefs about ourselves become equally bewildering. In the earlier phase of capitalism, in the 18th and 19th century, the average worker would change jobs in a lifetime. And I think this went on through the 40s and 50s. You'd change jobs once, maybe twice a lifetime. Now, people change jobs seven or eight times in a lifetime. What I'm pointing to here is that the self must find meaning now, however it finds it, in a system in which it, is, it just seems to me objectively true that the complexity level has reached a point at which nobody and this is not Cartesian doubt. You know, this isn't doubt brought on by an evil uh, genie who makes me wrong to my clear mind. No, we, we doubt in a different way now. We doubt that we could know enough about the big picture to even make sense. I mean, that's why, you know, one of the, the battle cries of these lectures will be to just make sense, because that will be very difficult to do because we'll be doing it in a situation in which there's way too much to make sense about, and under, in a situation in which the complexity of the systems within which we try to ma make sense are way, way too complicated. Even our purest motives get caught up in these systems. I'll give you an example. And I don't mean to have every environmentalist in the world burn my tapes, but let me give you an example of system complexity. Suppose America got behind recycling massively and we began to recycle and become a very efficient society. We'd all be proud of each other. And in our, and I mean, you know, nobody like debates environmentalism anymore, right? Even McDonald's is an environmentalist now. I mean, for God's sakes, McDonald's goes. You know. I mean, they're even for Martin Luther King now. I wish they were there a few years ago, but anyway, that's another uh, point. Uh, not, a, not a happy one. Uh, but no, suppose we became that environmentally conscious. Well, it, we'd all feel good. Our society would be cleaner. What would be the outcome in the third world where the only things they have to sell us are cheap labor and things that we can't ruin in this country? I don't think it's a long causal argument to see that an American renaissance and environment would be utterly disastrous for countries in the third world who have nothing to sell us but poisonous gunk. I mean, this is, this is bad, the bad news. This is, in a way, the disappointing thing about even contemporary political attempts to make sense of the self. I mean, we hear politicians say, oh, well, there's no conflict between the environment and the economy. And we go, yeah, I guess there doesn't have to be. But we, to the extent that we give it thought at all, it's not within the context of these large, massively complex systems about which, believe me, Bill Clinton, I think, clearly doesn't know any more than anyone in this room. In fact, I think the judgment of the American people is he knows far less about most of these. And this certainly isn't uh, the time to make a didactic political argument to bring in the last bunch of hacks who also couldn't deal with complexity. Because w the self under siege, part of what it's about is the complexity of meaning. Now, this makes the world a double world in a way. The world is on the one hand as rationalized as it's ever been. That means that 
down to its smallest detail, we have chased uh, what you might call, what I will call information, what universities call knowledge. I don't view it as knowledge. I'm sorry. I just, I look at it as information. I, 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 it, it is a, that itself is a deflationary term. We, we have tons of that. It's rational. That we chase it down. Now, here's the paradox, is that a world filled with instrumental, what I will call instrumental rationality, and by instrumental I will mean technical rationality, the kind that is measurable, quantifiable, that can be found in many of the sciences, in banking, accounting, and so on, advertising, the law, and so on, that this kind of technical reason produces a situation in which human beings themselves don't feel rational. And, it, and, and with the, especially with a younger audience, and I think this is really true with uh, uh, the 20 or 30-somethings that are out there listening to me, ask around and see how many of your friends, if you think the self isn't under siege in the late 20th century, ask yourself how many of your friends are on 12-step programs to stop something. Ask yourselves, given the current use of the word dysfunctional, who's not? I mean, you know, I, I mean, I, I, all, I mean, this is, to me, the best sign that the self is under crisis. There's a 12-step program to stop eating. Of course, if it succeeded utterly, you would die. 12-step programs to stop having sex. If that succeeded utterly, the species would die. 12-step programs to stop thinking are what we need next. Of course, they have those already. They're called network television. That's a, sort of a 12-step program that's on every night. Uh, but in any case, the self is under siege in this sense. Now, I don't want to... Here's going to be the problem of the lecture, is to try to give a sense for what the self was sort of more authentically. Because... That's the really difficult nut to crack, is that I too am, am sort of left with what one uh, person who enjoys some of the paradoxes of chaos is called a fractal self. You know, a fractal self, one that sort of reproduces itself and I'm like this over here and this over here. I'm a poker player here and a lecturer here and a, and a TV star here, yeah, and so on. But. Uh, I mean, it's not like that, you're, that this is some wisdom I can impart simply to you, but a joint project, and I hope, will lead to a conversation about it. Okay, uh, <clears throat> just a few more things here I need to get in, and they're very important. We are in a unique situation vis-a-vis -vis meaning, the meaning of the self in our own human autonomy. It is a unique situation. For, ye, for, for, for as far as I know, most of the history of this species, there have been culturally available reservoirs of meaning that were relatively stable and within which we could find a place for ourselves. Now, this is not an argument to go back to any of those archaic structures. I'm just trying to, to bring alive how they gave meaning. I mean, a slave's life had a meaning. It was a horrible and barbaric meaning from my perspective, but it was a meaning. And so that doesn't, this is not an argument for slavery. I think those are only made today by people like Pat Buchanan. I don't have rational arguments to return to the institution of slavery. I'm sure somebody on the far right will think of one for me, but I don't have them. But. We have, we, have, we have eras dominated by what are, are fairly called worldviews, where people find themselves within those views. They find a place that their life can have meaning within it. In particular, and for, our, and for, our, for Western uh, culture, the great religions have been such a place within which people could find the uh, sort of what you might call life's final question. Why am I here? What good do I do? What's the point in me being here? Where do I go when I'm through? 
big question. Job kind of had problems with that one. God didn't really answer him. He just got pissed off. I mean, you know, if you've read the book of Job, you know God doesn't answer the question. He just gets mad. Who the hell are you, Job? You tiny little mutant. What is this? You know, I made you. I can make another one just like you. Shut up. I mean, you know, this is... God, I mean, I'm not saying God was wrong to answer that way. I, I, I'm not in a position to talk about God that way. Uh, no, in, 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 as long as that could sustain people, faith in some kind of higher being, then there could still be a reservoir of meaning. And if you notice, that's still the neoconservative response is that we need a religious revival in this country. The trouble is with that response is that we have to pass through, one, a set of complex intellectual maneuvers where we either know or suspect we know. And I'll say, I, this will be sort of really to get around to the topic of the first lecture, whether we know or we suspect we know that those belief systems have come under considerable suspicion, okay? Considerable suspicion. In fact, one of the legacies of the, of the 19th century, and this is the title of my first lecture, which I'm just now getting around to explaining or trying to explain. The title of my first lecture is The Masters of Suspicion. It's a wonderful book called The Philosophy of Paul Ricoeur. Collects a whole series of articles by the French philosopher Paul Ricoeur. And I'm not interested in all the articles. He has one in here about uh, uh, the critique of religion. And in it, he mentions the three great masters of suspicion of the 19th century. And it's not merely their intellectual work that began to make us feel estranged and alienated and separated from the holy world of previous times, the world in which we could find our meaning in God or through his works. They reflect a, 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 a sea change in the species view of itself. I would, I would have included the name of Darwin, the first, you know, to give a natural explanation of how we got here. To give, in the case of Marx and Nietzsche and Freud, the reason they're mentioned by Ricoeur is they raise a criticism that I personally don't see how any argument could get around. In a way, it's a counterpart to the believer's faith. Just like the believer's faith, even today in the late 20th century, if you want to hang on to it stubbornly enough, can't be shaken, although that's cold comfort given that any belief you want to hang on to stubbornly can't be shaken or the nature of human beings to be stubborn, obdurate to reason, and so on. Uh, 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 the, 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 the suspicion they raise is, is much deeper, and, and I think Ricoeur puts them together well, because when you're faced, and, and you will be, in, if, at least in some uh, exciting intellectual context with these critiques of religion, at first you will notice only the negative part, in other words, the destructive part of the criticism. And I'll run through them quickly. I mean, and they can be run through quickly because these names, Nietzsche, Marx, and Freud, even Bill Bennett agrees they're all classics. Okay, so we're not, you know, we're not in here to like convert anyone to any other new religion or anything. These are classics. They are, in fact, markers in our culture of this sea change I'm talking about. They put before us the problem of false consciousness, of the self being false to itself. That problem is one that religion was ill-equipped to, to deal with. Ill-equipped to deal with. As long as we could believe with Descartes that if we knew something clearly and distinctly, we knew it, we were okay. But then when the suspicion crept in from the direction of Freud, that we could know something, but it would really be a forbidden piece of our sexual history, prohibited and thus channeled in another direction that, that was bobbling out of our little lips, then, and, and that consciously we'd never admit it. I mean, I'm, by the way, not being a, a full-blown a full, uh, Freudian, I do believe sometimes a uh, pencil is just a pencil. I think any one of these theories can be taken too far. But it's clearly the case that the field of the unconscious undercuts religion in a very important way. 
gives a very profound explanation of it. Of it as a what people go, well, how, how in the world could we not have a, a, a belief in God? This seems to be most Americans' attitude, even those who are not Catholics, Jewish, Christian, whatever. They just answer those damn surveys that you get in USA Today where 98% of them go, I believe in God. Which, of course, that just irritates the hell out of me. I mean, it, it, I, you know, I grew up around Baptists that, 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 that hated, that they loved God, they loved their fellow man, but they just hated folks. You know what I mean? They loved God, but they hated everybody they knew. I mean, it was just... You get a lot of that from, like, the Jesse Helms crowd. I mean, they just love God, but they hate everybody else badly. Sort of irritating, given the great religious traditions. In any case, Freud raises a suspicion that when we're very, very small, we're very, very insecure, we cry out to these larger beings for help, and they give it to us. And we go, oh, I see. But when we get older, and, and uh, I, think one, I think a very nice passage in literature is uh, Ray, Ray Bradbury's Dandelion Wine. I hope, I hope some of you have read this book. It's about a young man growing up uh, in the Midwest, and he goes to the movies. It's a cowboy and Indian movie. He looks up on the screen, and he's about 12, whatever. And he sees an Indian being shot. And, and for this is, he goes to cowboy and Indian movies all the time. But today it occurs to him, Douglas, that he too one day will die. He goes, ooh, it's a bummer thing. And so he gets out of the theater and he's, he begins to ponder that. You know, just, well, that that's, that's, really, that's really bad. I too one day will, will die. That kind of insecurity that we all have, I mean, the only democratic institution, contrary to popular political theory in the world, is death. Utterly democratic, it seems to me. I mean, if you want something that's democratic, there it is. It's death. It's, it's utterly democratic. It seems to me that that young Douglas is going to go to his mom and dad, and, 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 and they'll talk to him about it and explain how it fits and so on. And then will come that shattering night when you're about 16, and you find out mom and dad are afraid to die too, or maybe 14. And, you know, on a Freudian account, it's not accidental that that's the time at which you reach out for large and invisible fathers to protect you and love. But, and, and you know what? That's, that's an elegant suspicion. It is not an argument. It's an elegant suspicion. In fact, when you look at the, uh, the iconic significance of churches, you know, the, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, the family values stuff, you know? I mean, I hate to sound cynical, but as Freud says, the whole thing is so patently infantile. So obviously infantile, that to anyone with a love of humanity, it's just sad to think that most people will never rise above this view of life. Well, when, when you've had a snotty German talk to you that way, you begin to suspect he may be right, and this is one of the masters of suspicion. Marx comes at us from a different direction. He has noticed that history is generally written by the sides that win. You may notice that terrorists are people who have not yet won. And after terrorists win, they are freedom fighters. And after you've forgotten they're freedom fighters, then they are called chancellors or whatever. Marx has noticed this. And he's also noticed the complicity of religion with this. And I, I, I don't want to... Uh, this is not about ragging on religion. This is about trying to f explain why it could never be the safe harbor that it used to be. Because even for, for those of you with faith, and I haven't said I don't have it, the faith is rounded in by what? Complexity, suspicion, doubt. And I'm not talking now about doubt whether you, you know, I doubt my faith. No, I mean doubt that even if you unconsciously don't doubt it, you're still screwed up. You're wrong. That's the problem of false consciousness. That's why it's severe. 
is you could be absolutely clear you have no doubt, and it could be just a pure, abstract, cultural mechanism, and not you, and not you. Uh, in the case of, uh, of, uh, of Marx, what's being masked is economic interest. I mean, this insight has belonged to our culture, too. I think many of you will be familiar with Joe Hill's song, You'll Get Pie in the Sky When You Die. And there is a certain style of American religion. I call it the Billy Graham style. I don't dislike Billy. But it is notable that, you, that Billy Graham, you know, plays golf with the Pharaoh. I mean, that's not like Moses leading his people out of bondage. I mean, Moses didn't play golf with the Pharaoh and pray over the Pharaoh's troops. It's just a confusing thing when you see that. You know, you know. It's not like the story, exactly. It's hard to imagine uh, Billy Graham being crucified Although uh, I've suggested it on occasion, uh, people don't seem to listen. I, I try, I try. I mean, you know, uh, I'm not saying there aren't, there aren't any religious figures that are significant in the 20th century. There are magnificent ones like Gandhi, Martin Luther King. They appear as rare exceptions, rare exceptions. I mean, there are still people that try to lead their people out of bondage. Not everybody plays golf with the Pharaoh. But the suspicion hangs over the entire religious enterprise that it serves vested interests, economic interests. To be blunt with Marx, and I enjoy a blunt account of everything, that they are involved with that shit called money. The fundamental criticism Marx has of capitalism is correct. Communism is stupid, but the fundamental criticism is correct. And that's that our being is shaped by that murder, that yuck called money. Still is. Now, that doesn't, does that reduce complexity? No, not anymore it doesn't. Money flows around the world in tiny little circuits. We carry it in our pockets in little computer cards. We beg for it. We have like one little note on our credit history and we can't get a loan for a car. You got, it's just, even money isn't simple anymore. I mean, some people pray for the day when there used to be highwaymen. You could at least stop a coach and go, give me your money and get money. But now, you can't even go to the bank and get it. And I thought they had money at banks. But no, they don't. You go in, I'd like some money. No, we don't have it. Sorry. You don't know where to go then, right? It's confusing. This is complexity. <clears throat> okay, the third critique of religion comes from Nietzsche. And it's about the reversal that comes about when the religious, as it were, trick themselves about what they're really doing. And I think that there's some great examples of this, and, and I, I'm going to go for the easy examples since I'm running out of time, okay? Is that fair enough? I'm running out of time for the first lecture. I'll go for the easy examples. Uh, and, and the easy examples, of course, are Christian televangelism, although, although, subtler forms of this are always possible. It's like television. You get the crude, quick version on TV, but because everybody practically that we're around was raised by it, then they give you the slightly more complicated human versions of, of what brought them up. Their televisions. <laughs> Pretty scary. That's why the self is under siege. All of these are reasons why it is. <coughs> Nietzsche has, has noticed that uh, something's happened like, like the following. Uh, I'll try to sum it up with, with something I heard one night. Uh, Jerry Falwell say. By the way, this is all philosophical. Don't get confused. When we do philosophy my way, we just talk about what's going on and to try to find our way about. Because I, my negative remarks were, if you think that like John Rawls from Harvard can come up here and help you with this problem, then, then we're, it's useless. It's, I can't either, but we're going to at least talk about my inability to do so. There's a difference. So I call that the Socratic difference. I'm willing to talk about my inability to figure out who I am and my guess that most of you have the same problem. Well, anyway, let me go back to my Falwell story because it's too funny to leave out. You know, I think it's funny. Falwell has a, a line where he goes, you know, I love the homosexual, but I hate his homosexuality. For Nietzsche, that's a profound Christian remark. Oh, we Christians, we love our enemies. We love our enemies. If they hit us, we don't even hit them back. But someday our kingdom will come. You know, 
You've seen the bumper stickers. Someday our kingdom too will come. Of course, they say that because people are supposed to be so very humble in all they say. It's an irony not appreciated by everyone. The greatest passage here, and I, I've used it in a tape before, so if you have the other tape, just replay it now. But uh, now, the other, uh, the, the, uh, uh, Nietzsche has this wonderful quote where he goes, Dante, I think, committed a crude blunder, which is, of course, already a fairly arrogant remark, but he's a German, so what the hell. Dante, I think, committed a crude blunder when above the gateway to the Christian paradise, he placed the words, I mean, above the gateway to the Christian uh, uh, hell, he placed the words, I too was created by eternal love. I mean, that is in Dante. Above the gateway to hell is, I too was created by eternal love. Nietzsche says it would be, it would be, it would be truer to place above the gateway to the Christian paradise, I too was created by eternal hate, provided that one could write a truth above the gateway to a lie. See, people that write that pungently raise suspicions in our minds, you know, they raise these suspicions. And it's not just them. If you read St. Thomas carefully, and I'm not talking now about one of these renegade 19th century figures that set the stage for this sort of problem of meaning that we're faced with in the late 20th. But St. Thomas Aquinas himself says that among the, among the chief pleasures in heaven, will be that God will be kind enough to let us see the torments of the damned. Meanwhile, we live in faith, in hope, and in compassion. After these three are through with our intellectual culture, Marx, Nietzsche, and Freud, no one can believe, no one, it's like childhood's end for our culture. Follow me? It's childhood's end. You know how you can believe something when you're a child, and it's not like you can't come to believe it again when you're 60. You may be cynical about it again until you're 60, but these critiques mark childhood's end in regard to finding meaning in that religious framework. And, I mean, Paul Ricoeur has a beautiful phrase for it. He says, uh, the positive significance of these, uh, these criticisms I've mentioned is what they have in common, and that's their iconoclasm, the fight against the gods of men. That's very interesting. In other words, their iconoclasm is their fight against the gods we've created so far. That's, and that is what they have in common. <coughs> he goes on to say, this atheism that we've just discussed, this attack on the God or the gods of men, is not of the kind that, 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 that some contemporary philosopher is going to get up and dispute. Because this has to do with the very things that form the consciousness of the person who would be willing to dispute it. In other words, you'll, you, you'll never know after Marx uh, and, and, and Nietzsche and Freud whether your argument is an argument or a symptom. You follow me? You won't know whether you've got a good argument or a bad symptom. You just, there's no way. That's the problem of finding, you know, your real self here. And uh, Ricoeur himself is a Christian, and so he says the following. A Marxist critique of ideology, a Nietzschean critique of resentment, which is what I just discussed, and a Freudian critique of infantile distress are hereafter the views through which any kind of mediation of faith must pass. Now, does that mean that every ordinary religious person has to know these writers and stuff? No. These suspicions have become widespread in our culture. We don't need any more, in a way, to be instructed in them because they permeate our culture. This is what conservatives complain about, in a way. They go, well, you know, every time they show a Christian on TV, he's either out for money or he really hates people or it's some sexual thing. Where does that come from? See, the cultural critique of these people has insinuated itself everywhere. So the first thing you think when someone comes on a little too strong with religion is you start running through the masters of suspicion going, well, what does he want, my billfold? 
What kind of, is he on some bizarre sexual trip? Is this another Jimmy Swaggart thing? What kind of power trip is it for him, you know? I mean, we've got some of these guys in Dallas now who just get on TV and say, give me money because God says for you to give me money. You give me money and you'll get some money back. Not from me, but from God. He'll keep God's money. And you'll get money from God. And that's a nice deal between him and God. It's a wonderful advantage. Okay, now, the reason I've spent so much time on these Masters of Suspicion, the title of the first lecture, Masters of Suspicion, these are critiques that were developed in the 19th and into the 20th century. They've become a common possession of our culture, and they've cut off one of the reservoirs within which we might find a coherent meaning for our life. One of the reservoirs being religious faith. Not entirely. It's not like we can't go back and have it. It's that we must have it under the mark of complexity. Follow me? Under the mark of insecurity under the mark of confusion about it. It's, it's not that you can't, it's just under those marks. And then I, I think that I'll close this first lecture with a brief uh, little story from a movie, The Big Chill. Now, I hate the film The Big Chill. Let me make that clear, and I hope I can't be sued for hating a movie. I hate The Big Chill because it's about members of my generation, all of whom have become swine. The only person in the movie I like is dead when the movie starts. And they're having his funeral, and the old preacher says something quite profound. He asks the crowd of young yuppies, he goes, Isn't our common life together and just being a good man enough to sustain us anymore? And the answer to that is no. It's no. That's why people hate Bill Clinton. The symbolic reason they hate him is that is there was this background of sort of Kennedy-esque meaning and he was supposed to deliver it and it turns out he's just another slightly overweight southern guy and uh, our lives don't mean any more than they did a year ago and we're, and we're pissed we're mad at him we're going, damn it Bill we, we wanted an adventure, we wanted meaning we wanted hope it's, it's not just tax and spend I mean of course if you ask somebody I want your money, give it to me, they don't like you, but I mean, I, I, they can't figure that out either. That's part of their problem in politics. Uh, in any case, uh, the, the question of the big chill is what I wanted to conclude with, and that's uh, the, uh, the rhetorical question the preacher asks. Unfortunately, with the self under siege in the late 20th century, the answer to that is no. Our common life among our fellow human beings and leading the life of just a good man or woman is not enough to sustain us anymore. It's a shame.